All right, so today we are talking about what you can and cannot read from a crease pattern. So let's jump into it. I've got three tessellations in front of me and we're going to fold one of them together. Now, we're not going to fold precisely this exact cutout of the tessellation, but we're going to do another version of it with a 24 fold, so 24 divisions on the edge parallel direction, uh, triangle grid on a square, and I do have other videos on how to create this grid. Um, but for right now, let's jump in and look at some crease patterns and see what we can see. So first up, let's do some pattern matching, some pattern analysis. Um, there are things with each of these three tessellations that are different from a normal hexagons and triangles tessellation. And we're going to explore what each of those are over the course of today. But let's jump in to the pattern of the day, corset. And first things first, let's see if we can line up our tessellation with the crease pattern. So when I'm working with a tessellation, really anytime I'm working with a grid and a crease pattern, I want to be able to match up the orientation of what I'm working on with the orientation of the pattern itself. So let's see if we can do that here. We've got these closed hexagons and we've got triangles around it. Now I'm noticing here that the triangles around this hexagon are not all the same distance away. So four of them are the same distance away and then two of them are spaced further out. So these two here. And what we need to find is where in our pattern is this the case? So the easiest way to see that, since these are closed triangles on the back side, uh, we can see these valley folds forming the triangles. Whenever there's a valley forming the triangle, that triangle twist is on the back. Uh, likewise, when there's mountains, so I always use red solid lines for mountains and blue dashed lines for valleys. Whenever there are mountain folds outlining the center of the hexagon, then that hexagon is on the front side, at least relative to the diagram. Um, of course, with tessellations, front and back is kind of ambiguous. You can choose at your leisure which side you like better. So looking here at my quote unquote back side relative to the diagram, to the crease pattern, I can see that, okay, I've got these four triangles that are the same distance away, one spacing from the closed hole. And I've got these other two triangles that are two spaces away. And so those two I can use to orient and match with the crease pattern. Now, what I've got right now isn't an exact match because I'm flipped over onto the wrong side of the paper. But if I keep these two in mind when I flip back, then I can see that this is the exact orientation relative to the pleats that matches my crease pattern. So now that we're oriented, let's take a look at what this tells us. So first off, we've got this alternation of, okay, I do a hexagon, I travel along that pleat, I get to a triangle. So any hexagon I start with, any direction I go, I travel along a pleat and I hit a triangle. Likewise, any triangle, any direction I go off of the triangle, I hit a hexagon. So this is the hexagons and triangle six-fold tiling. We are alternating between a hexagon and a triangle. The next thing that I'm seeing here is these are closed hexagons and closed triangles. Now, how do I know this? 
well, I've looked at enough examples and I can pick out like, okay, this is closed, this is open, but also what I can do with any twist, literally any twist, is I can view it and I'm going to view it on the front side. So if it's a twist on the front, I'm going to say the mountains. I'm going to take the extension of these mountains of the pleats coming in, bring them in, and these six mountain folds all point straight to the same point, straight to the center. And when all of our mountain folds are pointing exactly in the same location, that is going to be a closed twist. These mountains have outlined a space, a zero dimensional point, and that zero dimensional point is what we see on the back side of our twist. That is what I call a closed twist. Then if those mountains were to outline a hexagon in the center, that would be an open hexagon twist. Uh, there's multiple forms of terminology for this. I call them closed, open. Um, ben Parker calls them closed and spread. Um, you can pick your terminology, but what I'm going to be talking about coming up in a few uh, weeks is that closed and open are not your only options. So it's important to be able to see, okay, where are these mountains pointing if I extend them into the center of my twist, and what does that mean for how I find things on my paper? Because that's what you actually see when you're folding. You see where those mountains are pointing to and what they are outlining. In today's case, we're working with closed twists, so they're all going to be pointing in to the same point. Likewise with the triangle, only this time, since the triangle is on the back, we're going to use the valleys as our extensions that are coming in. So these valleys are coming into the triangle and all coming to the exact same point. That means that that point is what's outlined on the front of the paper. So now we can use our crease patterns to read what is an open twist, what is a closed twist. We can see and align to our pattern. One thing I didn't mention is I chose to align this way, but it would be equally valid to align rotating 180 degrees around because each of these hexagons is in a position of twofold rotational symmetry. So in this hexagon, I cannot tell these two triangles apart from each other. I cannot tell these two triangles apart from each other. I cannot tell these two triangles apart from each other. But those three different directions are in fact distinct. So that is something that is different with this tessellation than a lot of other tessellations involving hexagons, where those three different directions would all be exactly the same. And if those three, or in this case six, directions around a hexagon are exactly the same, then you've got a hexagon in a position of six-fold rotational symmetry. Here, however, we just have two-fold rotational symmetry. So we see two, two, and two that are the same, and we can go on from there. So there's a lot of information in these crease patterns. It's just a matter of figuring out what information is relevant and what can be ignored. So for today's purposes, we're just going to focus on okay, what twists are present, how far are they apart from each other, and what direction is different from the others. And with those three pieces of information, we can start folding our tessellation. Now the difference between what we're going to fold today and this tessellation I've got in front of me is that here I also paid attention to another piece of information, which is how does this repeat? So if I look at how this tessellation repeats, I can see, okay, I go from this hexagon to the next. This is the same as if I went down. And this is the shortest 
distance between these hexagons, which ends up being the shortest distance in these lines. And then I made a choice where I said, okay, I want these lines as opposed to these lines or these lines to be aligned with the edge of my paper. And so that's the other great thing that a test, that a crease pattern is good for. It lets you see that, okay, instead of saying, oh, these things are exactly in line with each other on the same grid line, it lets you see, no, actually, you need to go over some spaces and down some spaces to get from one to the next. And so drawing this triangle between repeats, so two edges on grid lines and a third edge straight between repeats, is the information that you need to form a rotated grid that will align certain repeats with the edge of your paper. And um, I may go over that at the very end, um, but I have whole videos on how to rotate grids. So if you're interested in those techniques, please do check out those other videos. So I had mentioned that we have some other tessellations to look at as well. Um, one other example um, that I have that's not one of the ones that I showed you earlier, and see if you can tell the difference here, is this tessellation. And this one, we have a, um, a very similar pattern to this tessellation on the screen. But see if you can find the difference. Here, all of the triangles are equally spaced from the hexagons. So each triangle is the same distance from each hexagon and each hexagon is the same distance from each triangle, which we did not have in the previous case. So this is something to look out for when we're folding tessellations. If we're not careful, it's easy to slip into doing each direction the same, in which case you end up with something different uh, than what we're trying to fold today. So back to our main tessellation for today. Let's zoom out. We can fold this on really any shape of paper that we want. We can fold it on a square, which I'm going to do today. We can fold it on a hexagon. We can fold it on a rectangle. We can, we can really do anything we like with this. And so when I draw crease patterns, I'm not trying to tell you what shape or size of paper to fold it on. So just because I have this uh, drawn on a 64 fold triangle grid on a hexagon that's aligned with the edges of the paper does not mean that I think that you should fold it on a 64 fold triangle grid on a hexagon. In fact, I made a cutout of this same crease pattern for use today that shows this pattern exactly how we'll be folding it today, which is on a 24 fold triangle grid on a square. So I can take these pieces of the tessellation and play with them and see what my different options are. So with this one, I'm going to get um, basically three rows, um, basically a three by three grid of these hexagon twists. And we'll get whatever triangles fit in with that. And you can see very clearly that this line of hexagons is not in line with the edge of the paper. And this line of hexagons is not aligned with this edge of the paper either. So this is going to be a practice piece to develop the skills so you can then fold this tessellation on whatever grid you choose. So with that, let's get started. 
I'm going to bring back this view and bring in my grid. So the first thing we always want to do when we're working on a tessellation is find the center of our grid. And this is particularly useful when we're using closed twists. Um, I mean, it's useful in any case because you want to make sure you're actually folding from the center. Um, I typically fold from the center out uh, in concentric loops. Um, but also, this is useful so that um, so the process of finding the center is useful for setting up the mountain folds that we're going to use in our hexagon twist. So let me zoom in here so we can see exactly where our center is going to be and what we're going to do around it. Um, one thing that my crease patterns do have is more bold grid lines every eight divisions. So you can see another one out here, um, another one um, vertically in here. And these really help with counting and figuring out how much you actually want to fold. It also gives a hint. So something that a crease pattern can't necessarily tell you all on its own, but something that I try to show with my crease patterns is where the center should be. So I'll always put the center, if there's a clear position to put in the center, in the middle of a crease pattern. So let's dive in. When I have my grid, I'm going to fold it in half in front of me along a grid line. And then I'm going to find the position that is in the center of that grid line. And there's a couple ways that I can do this. So I can go to fold in half like I'm folding a square um, and find that point and just make sure that I see it. And for us today, I would recommend marking things um, to avoid confusion. I can also see my mark that I used to divide this 24 fold grid in thirds. I had to divide it in thirds so I would get 24 instead of 16 or 32. And that mark is going to be aligned with the center grid intersection. So just a, a fun fact to help with alignment. Now, the part that I said about this process helping us set up our folds for the next part. And by the way, the next thing after finding the center is aligning with the pattern that you're folding. These mountain folds coming out on either side of the central point are going to stay mountain folds as we continue folding. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually look to the crease pattern again. So I know that I'm going to have these six radiating mountain folds, but which side of those mountains does the valley go on? And in this case, the valley is around right-handedly from the mountain. So if I stick my thumb up in the center of the twist, put my fingers along the mountain, and curl my fingers, that's going to tell me the handedness. When my fingers curl and hit the valley parallel to the mountain that my fingers are on, then I have the correct hand. Now, if we look at the triangle twists, if I stick my thumb up in the middle of a triangle twist, put my fingers up along still the mountain and curl, my left hand will hit the valley. So all of my hexagons are right-handed and my triangles are left-handed and they need to be in this alternating relationship because the pleats need to pair up when they connect. So since my hexagon is right-handed, I'm going to have my valleys 
around and to the right. So my valleys are shifted counterclockwise from the mountain they are parallel to. With that said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these mountains that I already have up, pinch it all the way closed, just one grid intersection down, and I'm going to lay that over far from the center. So it's important to do this far from the center so I don't disrupt anything else that I'm going to put in. Then I'll take the next flap on the top side. So this is the bottom side, this is the top side of the pleat. And on the top side, I'm going to grab the next mountain and lay it down on its valley. Now, what I've got here is this little triangle in between the two, and I want this edge to stay as a mountain. This edge is actually going to be the edge right here of my hexagon twist, and I want to maintain that as I bring up each pleat in turn. So you can see I'm holding, making sure nothing goes funky from the top while I bring up my next pleat and lay it down. Then lifting the mountain from the bottom, setting it down, making sure again that my valley is that grid line one spacing over. And here I have two more lines to go. I'm going to make sure that that central hexagon can come up easily. Now what I did is I took this point from poked down to poked up and I gently emphasized the mountain in that direction. Now when I grab this fifth mountain it's going to make my sixth mountain emphasize even more. And if it would have had a kink in it, it would have really emphasized that too. And from there, I'm going to walk my way in along these pleats, getting them all in as closely as I can get them. And then I can take, so there, there's several ways to get the hexagon down all the way from here. One of the common mistakes that I see with these closed hexagon twists is people getting them down, but not around. So I'm going to show you how that happens and how to fix it. So if you're just pushing on these fins here until your hexagon is down, well, this has more folds in it than the diagram does, than the, than the crease pattern. So what we need to do, and also we tend to get scrunched up folds underneath, what we need to do is twist this so the corners come all the way around. So I picked up a corner and moved it over so the mountain fold coming out is completely straight. Then I move the next corner over and on top so its mountain fold is straight and I keep going around and at some point I have to let the first corner lift up a little so stuff can come out from underneath and I can get my whole hexagon twist down. Now what I'm doing right now is just checking my valley folds making sure there's nothing scrunched up underneath. And then I can iron down my twist and everything is good to go. So from here, I want to flip the paper over and we're going to see another feature of the crease pattern that I hadn't pointed out before. And this is that we can really get a lot of information 
by how many spaces are between the mountain folds in each direction. So the distance here is telling us a lot about the spacing in each direction. So since I'm folding on a square, I want to be really careful at this point that I'm maintaining my orientation with respect to that, those vertical grid lines. So I can maintain that chunk that I cut out of the crease pattern and make it match exactly with what I'm folding. So I'm going to be really careful to stay in this orientation, which again is the exact same as this orientation. So zooming in from here, just keep an eye out on that factor. What I can see here is that up and to the right, we have two mountain folds that go on up. Now this kind of looks like what we have here. We've got a mountain and a valley underneath, but that's not actually what we're looking at. Because remember, we flipped our paper over. And so this line that looks like a mountain right here is actually this valley over here because this crease pattern is looking from the opposite side. And so if we want to work with this fold, I'm going to reference it to the vertical. So this vertical mountain is actually the valley under here. And then in the crease pattern, two spacings to the right, now that we've flipped it over, that's going to be two spacings to the left. We have this other mountain fold, but because we flipped it over, it's going to be a valley. And then we have the next valley over, which on this side is a mountain that comes in and finds a grid intersection at the junction of the extensions of these two valleys, which on our side are two mountains, where we form a three-way intersection. So let's look at that move. I found my intersection point. So let me draw my two mountains here. I found my intersection point and I need a third mountain because I know I'm working on a pleat coming from a hexagon. I need to put a triangle there. And so I open the extension of this pleat. I erase the extension of the pleat from the center. And I bring up a new mountain that's exactly equally spaced with the other two. So from there, I can lay down this vertical pleat right next to the pleat that's already existing, the other vertical pleat. And I can go ahead and squash this closed triangle twist. Now this vertical here is what I call a tube pleat. It's what happens anytime there's two spacings between pleats that are going in opposite directions. Or we can say if there's pleat structures everywhere and there's two spacings between folds of the same color, you're going to have a tube. Now whether it closes in or closes under, is a matter of perspective. Are you looking from the front or from the back? But from this side, it closes in because those central lines are valleys. So there's one tube. 
we've got this tube right here. Now for our next twist, I want to make another tube. And this tube is made with the vertical pleat. So we've got our vertical pleat that's coming from the hexagon, not the one coming from the triangle we just made. And we're going to need to form a tube with that pleat and its neighbor. So we've got these tubes on either side of the vertical pleat from the hexagon. We've got a tube going up and to the left, which in this situation, since we flipped our paper over, is going up and to the right. It's the one we're making now. And we've got a tube going vertically up, which we already folded. So we set our valley, we set our mountain so that we can get this tube structure. And then we can set up our closed triangle twist and squash our new triangle. Now, when I set this up, this caused a pleat overlap and we're going to leave that be for right now. No need to rush into dealing with that. Okay, so these two triangles are exactly the same distance from the center. And we know that the pattern here goes same, same, different, same, same, different. And so, yeah, let me make sure I'm on the correct hexagon here. So same, same, different, same, same, different. So we know then that these next two pleats out from the center are going to have a different spacing than our first two. Now, what spacing is that going to be though? So here we have one, two spaces along the valley fold from the hexagon to the triangle. And here we have one, two, three. So one spacing further. And that's all we need, really. All we need to know is, okay, it's gonna be one spacing further out. So here, if we're looking from the closed hole and counting to the center of the triangle, because that's the important part, that's where we're actually going to take some action. We get one, two spaces from the corner, or sorry, from the closed hexagon hole to the center of that triangle. And so if we count on the next pleat, we need to go one, two, three spaces because we're going one further. And at that grid intersection, we need to make a three-way intersection. And then we can repeat our process. We can use the fact that our tessellation is the same this way as this way. And we can continue going around and say, okay, this one I already saw needs to create a vertical tube. So here's where I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit and um, this is also where I do recommend uh, watching instead of trying to keep up. As we fold, um, I'm going to be going fairly rapidly through bits that we've seen already um, so that we can get through the whole thing in a reasonable amount of time. So we got the vertical tube. Next, we need the diagonal tube. So I'm going to set up my next triangle, I can also see this as putting the next triangle with a center two spacings from the central hexagon twist and squash. And last but not least, I'm, I need a matching bar triangle that's going to be centered three spaces, so one, two, three, 
from the closed hole of my central hexagon. And then I can get that hexagon, or sorry, that triangle into place and squash it. And you can see I've got these two bow ties. That's fun. So from here, I'm going to need to flip over to the opposite side of the paper. I'm going to remember that I am flipping over a vertical axis to maintain my edge parallel grid lines running up and down. And then I've got all of these pleat overlaps, these places where one pleat goes through and then another pleat crosses it, that tell me the locations of the next hexagons. So I don't actually even need the crease pattern to tell me where the next hexagons are going to be. So I can take this pleat overlap open it up. So I take the pleat that was done most recently, open it at this location. I'm not opening everything because we want to keep that triangle there. I'm going to pop up even further so I can identify this target hexagon around the point where these two mountain folds run into each other. So once I've identified the target hexagon, I can go around and start putting in my mountain folds in each of my four new directions. And you can see here that I'm going in the same order that I did in the center. I'm working with what I have and then laying on top, on top, on top, on top. And here's another method for getting your hexagon down uh, that you can never leave it in a untwisted state, which is poke the center, and grab three edges along the outside, and give it a scrunch and twist, and then smooth it out down below. This is the fastest way to fold a closed hexagon. Um, and in general, any crumpling that happens smooths out when you use your bone folder after. So next up, we've got another intersection here, but we actually have two overlaps. So which one is the center of the hexagon? Well, it's the one that's coming from two triangles. It's also the one that's closest in. So when we're looking at pleat overlaps and trying to figure out which one to fold, we always want the one that's closest in. So we're not folding something and then trapping something else in a pleat overlap. So here, those two mountain folds are coming together to this point. And here, if we try to just ignore this pleat over the top of the hexagon and fold things around, we're going to run into a royal mess if we try to then undo that to put other stuff in. So what do we do? Well, we know that two pleats coming from two hexagons need to lead to a triangle. They can't go straight into each other. And we know that the mountain up here is going to continue on out from our hexagon. And since this is a right-handed hexagon, the valley needs to come through at this point. But this point runs into the mountain from the other hexagon. So what do we do? we let the valley take priority. We scrunch that down into the valley and pretty it up a little so everything's on grid lines. And we let the new pleat fold over on top. 
So I'm letting this fold over on top and I've still got a 3D mess up here. And what I'm going to do to resolve that mess is at this point where the mountain folds over on top of the other mountain, I'm going to run a new mountain out at a 120 degree angle. So we've got three 120 degree angles here. The angle between this mountain and the overlying mountain, the mountain between the new mountain coming in, and the one I'm going to put going out. And we need to clear up this space out here. Because if I have a mountain here, I need a valley on the far side. And we need to get rid of any extension of the fold from this hexagon that was going on out. So this is what I call a triangle wrap. Once these folds are all in place, this will then lay flat again. Now what have we done here? We've put in where the next triangle is going to be and left it as a three-way intersection that's laying down flat for the time being. Flipping back to the top side, we can continue putting in our new pleats of the hexagon. And once we have all six pleats, we can grab and scrunch that hexagon down, cleaning up any scrunched bits at the end. So there we've got another hexagon twist and let's leave this triangle for right now and we'll get back to it once we've done this for the rest of our pleat overlaps. So we have options. There's always options with what order to fold our twists. We could resolve these uh, triangle wraps as soon as we put them in, or we could continue around and resolve them once we flip our paper over anyways. So next up, I've got another three-way, or sorry, another pleat overlap. And you'll notice I, I rotated my paper out of alignment with the crease pattern. And that's because from here, I'm not folding according to the crease pattern. I'm folding according to what's on my paper. So I'm looking at this pleat overlap. Again, I want the one closer into everything. So this pleat going out from this triangle has two overlaps on it. We want the one that's closer into the triangle. And I'm going to do exactly those same steps. So I'm going to find the center of my hexagon because I'm looking at the extensions of these mountains where they hit each other. Then my next pleat on top, I'm going to run the mountain out and I need to pop the mountain from the previous hexagon down into the valley of my current hexagon. And I can see down here in the paper, I can see these positions where two valley folds are running into each other. I can use that as a key of where my third valley needs to be. So just like looking at the diagram here, let's say I'm looking at this triangle here, I've got a valley coming in one side, going out the other, and I've got that vertical valley as well. They all come to the same point. These are exactly the valleys that we see in the crease pattern because we're on the side that the crease pattern is looking from. So then I need a mountain to match with my new valley, and that can all come closed. That is me setting up a triangle for the other side without going to the other side. Then bringing everything back down, 
closer to my desk, I set up the remainder of my pleats around the hexagon. And you'll notice here, this triangle, triangle wrap is closer to these two hexagons, closer to the previous hexagon than this one was to its previous hexagon. And that's because we've played with the spacing. We're not evenly spaced everywhere, so we shouldn't expect everything to be evenly spaced everywhere. So then I can grab this hexagon, twist it around, and here you'll see I didn't maintain the edges of my hexagon, and so that was a little bit of a harder fix at the end. So when I scrunch my hexagons down, I do want to emphasize maintaining the edges so it's easier to get in the end. So then coming around to the next pleat overlap, I'm going to do exactly the same thing, keeping in mind we do have different spacing in different directions. So you'll see here I did grab this one pleat that's quote unquote underneath um, before I'm moving to the pleats up above. Um, and that is partly habit, partly making things easier on myself because that pleat that I put in first causes a pleat overlap and crosses a lot of paper. And so it would be a little bit harder to put in as the final pleat as opposed to these two that either cross very little paper, paper or don't have any pleat overlaps. So then this hexagon too gets the same treatment where I scrunch it down and around. And the, again, this guarantees that I don't end up with the hexagon sitting rotated back on top of its base. And I don't want it rotated back because one, it sits down nicer when it's all the way rotated. And two, it doesn't match the crease pattern when it's not all the way rotated. <laughs> I can be a little bit pedantic about that, but if we're going to use a crease pattern, we may as well, you know, actually match it. Um, and also, when your hexagon twist is back rotated, it can sometimes mess with the backlighting. And I'm all about the backlighting. So, Next up, we've got two more hexagons in this round around. And here I'm running into the pleat overlap that's harder to open because one of my, so we went around in a consistent direction, making those triangles on the back. But when we came back to the first one, I didn't switch the pleat ordering. And so I had one pleat overlap that was different from the rest. The order was different. So getting this hexagon into place, I'm then going to bring that around. And I will emphasize that this technique does work a bit smoother when you have a finer grid. This is about as coarse of a grid as I really ever work with, especially on this paper. And last but not least, our final hexagon on this side. Again, we're going for that pleat overlap that's closest in, that's coming from two triangles, no hexagons involved. And here, as I was saying with the triangles on the opposite side, um, if so I've come full circle. I now need a triangle on each side because I didn't have a previous hexagon for my first hexagon going around. So here it's actually going to be easier. I don't need to force a valley through. I just let my new valley come down to the bottom of the page and on the upper side, I do need to pop that valley down until it meets with the valley of the pleat that I popped. 
then I can complete that wrap and get the rest of my pleats in place before and I'm pushing down in the center in hopes of keeping my outer hexagon rim intact as I bring it down and get that next hexagon. So yeah, this really does uh, use a lot of um, a lot of different skills and it can take some time to get used to folding these triangle wraps. I know my students have um, sometimes struggled with this for months before it just snaps and makes sense. Um, and here we can see those lines of twists starting to show up. So from here, flipping over to the back side, we've got six of these triangle wraps to resolve. And the way we're going to resolve them, we know the positioning is correct because it's working off of positions that we already knew were good. We're simply going to take that mountain fold and shift it over so the valley is on the shadow side. So this is another Ben Parkerism, putting, flipping the mountain to the shadow side, and we can then squash each of these closed triangle twists in turn. If these were open triangle twists, then we would have a little bit more to do, but here we have our closed twists. And all we need to do is flip that mountain over and go ahead and squash. So from here, if you'll recall the diagram that was cut out to the uh, 24 fold triangle grid on a square earlier, we're going to have just two more hexagon twists on our paper. And here, actually, I'm going to bring up that cutout so we can see exactly what we're looking for and work from there. So we've got our three hexagons through the center. We've got two of the ones above and two of the ones below. So working from this view, let's continue onwards. I'll shift this ever so slightly so it fills the screen. There we go. So continuing from here, I'm going to need another hexagon up here. I do not, however, have the triangle on the back side that's required to pinpoint the location. So what can I do about that? Well, there's a couple things that we can do. One thing is to see that I'm going to need a tube going vertically. There's our old friend, the vertical tube again. And if I have a tube going vertically, well then it's going to follow this mountain on one side and the mountain right here on the other. So if I let that mountain come up, it's going to need a valley on the far side and well, what do you know? This really looks like that triangle wrap again. I can just take this little corner, squish it and down and in. And there I've got the setup for my next hexagon. I can then, so I've got these two mountains that are pointing towards the center point. I can then take this topmost or next laying on top pleat. I see I need to put a valley 
down and through until it hits the valley under the pleat coming from the neighboring hexagon. Put in that triangle wrap. And then get the rest of my hexagon in place. Here we are pretty close to the edge, so we can actually fold it down smoothly as we go. So from here, I'm going to flip my paper over and open up these two triangle wraps into full closed triangle twists. I can, at this point, choose if I want to put the closed triangle twist on this pleat here, which is exactly the same as this one down here or this one up here. I'm going to go ahead and do it. I can see that these two are my long direction out. So this is going to be a short direction that forms a tube. And I can go ahead and get that triangle twist in. And it's not actually going to interact with anything else, so I'm free to move on to my next twist. Now here I've got a vertical pleat, which as we've seen in just the prior twist, is going to be a close direction pleat. So I could go ahead and put in my next triangle here. And where it's causing this overlap, I can either hold this tip under or get a little bit of a three-way intersection going on under there and have that stay put while I squash my twist. From here, I can follow the same logic. Here, I need a long distance triangle. So it's going to be centered three spacings out, not two. And squish down right here by the edge. And again, since we flipped our paper left to right, that triangle is going to be equivalent to this triangle at the edge. And then that's going to feed into a kind of partial hexagony thing at the bottom where we can get just this little bit. So it was scrunched in here. We can open that up and have it be a little bit hexagony. And just like this little bit is a little bit hexagony, like we see in these two mountain folds that form an edge of the um, hexagon that would be down below. So that's how I would finish off this bottom edge and then I can rotate halfway around and do exactly the same thing again from here. So I want to have my next hexagon and actually I'm going to hold it in the same orientation as I did before. So I'm going to have this vertical tube causing triangle wrap down here. And this is going to feed directly up into the new hexagon. I'm going to have a triangle wrap over on this side, on the left side here. So feeding up into this triangle. And get the rest of my hexagon in place before I squash it all down and spin it all the way around. Flipping the paper over, I'm going to open up these triangle twists. And then I can get 
my next triangle in here. It's a vertical pleat. So we're going to have a tube going this way. And again, next vertical pleat, we're going to have a tube again here. I basically fiddle with it until I find an arrangement that lays flat or I just tuck this whole corner under. And this part is more about just getting the twists on the page, getting that pattern propagation out to the edge of the paper. Here I'm going to go three spacings out instead of two because this is my far direction. And I've got this twist right at the edge of the paper here that I can go ahead and squash down. So that finishes up the folding of corset on a 24 fold triangle grid on a square. Now let's take a quick look at these repeats so we can see how we would use them to fold a more display style version if we don't want to rotate the triangle grid on a square because that math is frankly nasty. Um, the math for rotating grids on hexagons is much nicer. In fact, we can take this image here of of our crease pattern and say, okay, I want this point in the center of this hexagon to line up with this point in the center of this hexagon at, and I want that line to align with the edge of my paper as it does here. So then I'm going to take these counts of one, two, three, four, five, five up and two in. So notice that I'm making a specific turn here. I'm turning and using this 120 degree angle and I'm turning one grid direction clockwise. So that's going to matter because the order of these two numbers does matter. So if I said instead, okay, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, that would be the wrong direction. We want to go up first and then up and to the right, not the opposite. So our numbers are five and two. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the second number and we're going to make a fraction. We're going to say, okay, two divided by five plus two. 2 over 7. Okay, that's going to be the fraction up the right-hand edge of my hexagon that I need to make. So I need to go 2 sevenths of the way up. It's going to be around here. Mark that point and then fold a rotated grid from that point. And for all the, all the details on that, um, check out my project planning masterclass, uh, which has all the details, has live question and answer sessions, um, like has updates annually. We'll have everything on all of the project planning stuff that I get from doing math and reading crease patterns. Um, and what we're able to do by rotating the grid, you can see in this pattern, I am not having grid lines aligned with the edges of my paper. Not in the slightest. So I've got three directions here. This one, this one, and this one. And none of them match the edge of my paper. So that's because I used a rotated grid to align these lines of twists with the edge. I chose to do it on a hexagon, even though the pattern would look really good uh, if I did it on a square or a rectangle, because the math on the square and the rectangle leads to 
nasty square roots of three and stuff um, that I didn't want to deal with. So that's what's going on. That is the final thing that you can read from a crease pattern um, to get very nice display style pieces with your folds. So with that, uh, I'm going to call it an evening or call it a day. And I hope to see y'all all back next week when I'm going to start talking about some advanced twists and what you can do with them, uh, what this means uh, for the things that you can fold. So I'll be starting off with the hybrid square twist, uh, which I use in many of my patterns, and we'll go from there. All right. So happy folding, everyone, and I'll see you next week.